you can say a flower is a specialized part of an angiosperm that may occur singly or in clusters. Singly, that is, could be individual or it will come in groups. Now, remember your SS1 when you were taught the classification of living things, talking about the kingdoms. Remember, we have plants as one of the kingdoms. Kingdom plantae. Now, that kingdom plantae, remember, was divided into three, into bryophyta, talophyta, and tracheophyta. Now, I'm trying to show you the origin now when we talk about flowering plant. So, the tracheophyta is divided into two. There we have spermatophyta. And we have pteridophyta. Pterido. Now it is this spermatophyta that is then divided into another two divisions where you have angiosperms and gymnosperms. So when we talk about flowering plants, we are actually referring to this. So we are focusing on angiosperms. So by definition, we said a flower is a reproductive part or a special part in angiosperm that help them to reproduce. So don't forget angiosperm as a division of spermatophytes. So that's the definition of a flower. Now that we know what a flower is. We'll be looking at the parts of a flower. A flower is consists of many parts, many parts. As you can see, here we have close to 10. However, all the parts you are seeing in the flower can be grouped into four. So a flower is made up of basically four parts. A fly is made up of basically four parts. And these are the parts, the four major parts. We have the sepals, we have the petals, we have the pistil, and we have the stamen. Now, these are the four major parts that we have in the flower. However, these four major parts, they give birth to other parts, other subsidiary parts that you saw in the diagram. Let's look at these parts and what function they perform or functions in a flower. To start with, sepals. Don't be confused. Many a times, when you are going through textbook, you come across this word, calyx. Calyx. Sepals, a group of sepals is what we refer to as calyx. A group of sepals is what we refer to as calyx. Now, this sepals, this is the first wall, the first part you see in the flower. Looking at the image again, Coming from down, you see the sepals. Most, in most flowers, they are green. So that is what we refer to as sepals. That is the first structure you see after the receptacle. So the main function of the sepal is to protect the flower during budding stage. When the flower is still in the budding stage, the sepals have like an envelope to protect the flower that is just budding. That is sepal. And don't forget, sepals, and when you come across the word calyx, it's talking about a group of sepals. Then we talk about the second major part in a flower. Petals, or you see the word corolla. Corolla. Don't be confused. A group of petals 
collectively is known as Corolla. So when you come across this, don't mix them up. They are just talking about the same thing. The group of petals is referred to as Corolla. Now, what is the function of petals? Looking at the image, the petals is the second wall after the sepals. And it is the eye-catching part of the flower. It's the part that attracts insects to the flower. In most flowers, they have different colors. You must have come across different colors of flower, pink, purple, white. Basically, the part that is giving you the color is the petals, or we call it corolla. Now we move to the third part of the flower, pistil. This is called pistil, or you see the word caper, or you see the word gynoestium. Pistil, or caper, or gynoestium. Now, a group of pistil or caper is what we refer to as gynoestium. This is the one we can refer to as the female organ in the flower, the female part. That's the pistil, carpet, or gynoecium. Don't forget, when you see either of these three, know that we are talking about the female part. And this pistil has three parts. A pistil consists of three major parts. The stigma, pistil, we have the stigma, the style, and ovary. These are the three parts that a pistil is divided into. We have three major parts there, the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Accordingly, when you come from the top, looking at the picture again, the image on our screen, you see the capel there. Now, you will see that capel is written here, not pistil. So when you look at this capel, we have three parts there. The stigma, the ovary, and the star. Accordingly, from the top, the pistil or the capel, the apex part of it is the stigma. Looking at the screen, the image you have there, you see that the apex part of the flower is the stigma. Then you have the style. The style is like a tube, the slender part that connects the stigma to the ovary. So we have the style. Then you have the swollen part, the basal part down there. That is the ovary. In our image, you see that in that ovary, we have oval there. That's basal part that is swollen. That's what we refer to as ovary. So don't forget, pistil, capel, or gynoecium is referred to as that's the female organ in the flower. Then we look at the last part. That's the stamen. Stamen. Stamen, as the name is, a group of it is called andresium. Andresium. Androesium. That's the male part. And you know when we say that's the male organ, it means the male gamete is produced in that spot. This stamen also consists of parts, but two now. Unlike that of PC where we have three. Stamen consists of two parts, and these are anta and filament. Now, you will observe that in this image, we have anta as a swollen part at the top, and you have the slender stalk that is holding it into position, which is referred to as the filament. That filament, you discover it is a similar structure to style in capel. So that is the stamen. So these are the four major parts that we have in flower. Out of these four major parts, we have these five subsidiary parts. I hope now, without checking any notes, without thinking too much, 
you can list the four major parts and also the subsidiary parts we have in the flower. So these are the parts that we have in the flower. Now that we know the parts that we have in the flower, I need you to take note of this. Based on the number of parts that we have in a flower, we can classify flowers into two groups. Into two groups. And we have complete and incomplete flower. What do we mean by complete flower? A complete flower is a flower that has these four major parts. These four major parts. That's what we call complete flower. However, an incomplete flower is a flower that naturally one or two of these parts are missing. I think that again. A complete flower has these four major parts that we have discussed. Why an incomplete flower? Naturally. That word is very key. Naturally. It's not as if someone has detached it. But by nature, one or two parts are missing. Then that flower is described as incomplete flower. Why do we need to know this? At times, in your biology practical, you may be given a flower and you have to describe that flower. One of the concepts, one of the terms that you can use to describe that flower is look at the flower. If you have all the parts mentioned, then you can describe that flower as a complete flower. And if any part is missing, you can describe that flower as an incomplete flower. I believe you understand that. Now we move on. Now that we know the parts that we have in flowers, and we have discussed all their functions, we move to terminologies. In reproduction, in flowering plants, there are numerous terminologies. When I say numerous, I mean numerous. However, we'll be looking at these ones, what they mean and how to use them. The first one, complete flower, incomplete flower, polycephalous, gamocephalous, polypetalous, gamopetalous, monocarpus, syncarpus, and apocarpus. Don't forget, the spellings are very important in biology, so you must get it right. Complete flower, like I said earlier, a flower that has all the four major parts. While an incomplete flower is the one in which one or two parts of the flowers are missing. Now, polycephalous. Let's start from that. Poly, as the name implies. When we say poly here, we are saying that particular flower has many sepals. As you can see, you remember the image, we have different petals there, and we have different sepals. Now, when we say polycephalous, polycephalous, what we are saying is that that particular flower is made up of sepals that are separated. Sepals that are separated. So when you look at a flower and you discover that, oh, the sepals are not joined together. They are standing alone. Like we have in our image earlier, looking at the image of the flower that we, have, we are considering. Now look at the sepals here. One is standing to the right, one is standing to the left. They are not joined together. They are not fused together. So we describe this as polycephalous. So when you look at it, you can easily say, oh, this is polycephalous flower, separated sepals. Now, we can also have gamocephalous. Gamocephalous is the opposite of polycephalous, meaning the flower is consists of sepals that are fused, that are joined together, forming something like a cup. That's what we refer to as gamocephalous. I hope you understand that. Polycephalous, separate sepals, gamocephalous, fused or joined sepals. 
confused. Now, another concept we'll be looking at now is polypetalous. Polypetalous. Polypetalous and gamopetalous. Poly, polypetalous. As the name is, you should know that it has something to do with petals. Just like we have described polycephalus and gamocephalus. So polypetalus is talking about a flower that is having petals that are separated. Looking at the image that we are considering again, you will discover that the petals are separated. You can see one, two, three. So they are separated. This flower now can be described as a polypetalous flower. Don't forget, first of all, you can describe this same flower as a complete flower. You can also describe it as polypetalous, then polycephalous. So it's a separate petals. Then gamopetalous, when you have the petals fused together to form something like a cup. That's what we refer to as gamopetalous. Then we have other concepts that we can use to describe flowers. And that is, we have a term there, monocarpus. We have syncarpus. Then we have apocarpus. These three terminologies, they are used to describe flowers by considering the carpel. As you can see, carpels, carpel. So when we say carpels, we are using that, considering the carpels to describe the flower. You can describe the flower in three ways. Is it that the flower is monocarpus, syncarpus, or apocarpus? What do you mean by monocarpus? Don't forget mono, monocot, one. So this is a flower that has only one carpel. And when a flower is having only one carpel, it's described as monocarpus, then there is possibility that the flower is having two or more. Two or more. When the flower is having two or more, generally, we describe them as polycarpus. Polycarpus, two or more. Capels. Now, polycarpus flowers, that is flowers having two or more capels, can be described in two ways. Is it that they are syncarpus or they are apocarpus? Syncarpus flowers are flowers that have two or more capels and they are joined together. The, the two or more capels are joined together. Why apocarpus is a flower that has two or more carpels, and they are not joined together. They are separated, as we can see in this image. Now look at this image on your screen. Monocarpus. You see the first one is having only one carpel. The second and the third one, each of them has three carpels. But there's a difference between the second and the third one. The second one is apocarpus, having three carpels, but they are separated. Why the third one is having three carpels and they are fused together. So when they are fused together like that, we call them syncarpus. When they are separated, they are referred to as apocarpus flower. So when you see the next flower, when you visit a garden or you move around and you see any flower, check them and use any of these concepts to describe them. Is the flower gamocephalus? Is it polypetalous, is it monocarpus, apocarpus, or syncarpus? Now let's move on. Process of reproduction in flowering plants. The process of reproduction in flowering plants occurs in three main stages. This process occurs in three main stages. For you to easy, for easy remembrance, we can, you know, there's a document we refer to as PDF, a PDF document. But in this case now, 
this is not arranged accordingly. But at least PDF will give you an idea of the first letter for each stage. In the reproduction of flowering plants, we have P standing for pollination, D standing for development of embryo, and F standing for fertilization. Accordingly, these stages will come this way. PFD, pollination before fertilization, then development of embryo. So the three main stages that are involved in the reproduction of flowering plants is they are pollination, fertilization, and development of embryo. Don't forget, now we'll be looking at each of these, what happened at each stage of this reproduction. The first one we'll be looking at is pollination. Pollination, right from your elementary science, you have been taught what pollination is. Transfer of pollen grains from an anther to a stigma. From an anther to a stigma. Now, going back to the major part that we have on the board, you know we have mentioned anther and we have mentioned stigma. We mentioned anther as one of the parts that we have in stamen. And we mentioned stigma as one of the parts we have in pistil. Don't forget in pistil, that's where we have ovary, style, and stigma. While in stamen, we have anther and filament. Now, pollination is now defined as the transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma. You know, it's as if you are saying transfer of pollen grain from pistil to stamen. But the definition is just driving it deeper. There is not just pistil because if you say just from pistil, it could be from ovary, it could be from style. So the definition is telling us that the transfer of pollen grain from which aspect of the pistil? From anther, aspect of the stamen, from anther to which aspect, which part of the pistil? Stigma. So don't forget I told you the pistil is the female part while the stamen is the male part in flower. So pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma. It could be Anta to stigma of the same flower, which we refer to as self-pollination, or anta to stigma of another flower. That's what we refer to as cross-pollination. That topic will be considered in details next time. So pollination is the first stage in the reproduction of flowering plants, and it has to do with transfer of pollen grain. Now, let's take note of the words in the definition. Pollen grains. When we talk about pollen grains, this is like the gamut that is being donated. The gamut that is being donated by the male part of the flower to the female part, which is the stigma. Now let's look at this pollen grain. On the left there, we have the structure of pollen grain. You need to take note of this parts in the pollen grain, we have the tube nucleus. You see that we have two nuclei in the pollen grain. You have one at the top and one down, that one painted yellow. Now, this, that is why we can de uh, describe a pollen grain as being binucleate. Binucleate. That is, it has two nucleus. The pollen grain has two nucleus. And what are the two nucleus we have in pollen grain? We have tube nucleus and we have generative nucleus. So apart from these two nuclei that you must take note of in the structure of pollen grain, there are other interesting and important parts that you must consider. You must know each time you ask to draw a pollen grain, you have to include them. The first one, 
the tube nucleus, generative nucleus. Then we have the walls, the walls surrounding the pollen grain. There are two walls there, exine and intine. Exine. The outer wall is the exine, while the inner wall is the intine. So take note of that in the pollen grain. These two nuclei that we have in pollen grain will be explaining what they are used for as we proceed in our class. Then you have by the right the oval. Oval is present inside the ovary. I showed you when I was showing you the image of a flower that in the ovary, the basal part, the swollen part, you have oval inside the ovary. Now you have the oval of an angiosperm. There is a part there, the entrance up there, that is called micropyle. Micropyle. Take note of that term also, micropyle. And also tube nucleus and generative nucleus. We will refer to them as we continue. So that's the first stage in the reproduction of flowering plants. Pollen grains are transferred successfully from the anther to the stigma. Now, once pollen grain has been transferred, what is the next thing? Don't forget PFD. After pollination, we move on to fertilization. Fertilization is another important stage. When we talk about fertilization, it has to do with the union or the fusion, the coming together of the male gamete and the female gamete. That's what we refer to as fertilization. It is the next step after pollination. Once a pollen grain has been successfully transferred from the anther to the stigma of, the, of another flower or of the same flower, the next thing that will happen is fertilization will take place. Now, for fertilization to take place, there are different events that must happen. First of all, as soon as... Okay, I think this can go now. As soon as pollination is done successfully, and what do I mean by successfully? Okay. Successfully in the sense that the grain is matured, the stigma is also receptive at that point in time. So as soon as the pollen grain lands on the stigma successfully, fertilization wants to take place now. For fertilization to take place, this pollen grain will pass through different stages. The first thing that will happen to the pollen grain is that there will be absorption. Absorption. The pollen grain will absorb a sugary fluid that is being produced by the stigma. And as soon as the pollen grain absorbs that, don't forget, once, it is, once something is absorbed, there is every tendency that there will be a swelling. So the pollen grain will swell up. After the absorption, there will be swelling. Once there is swelling, don't forget in the image, in our picture of pollen grain, I told you two major walls, the outer exine and the inner intine. Now, once the pollen grain has absorbed the fluid and is swollen, then the exine will break. The exine will break. As soon as the exine breaks, it will give way to the intine. The intine will then grow into what is called pollen tube. Pollen tube. So once the intine grows into what is called pollen tube, this pollen tube will grow downward. Don't forget the grain is on the stigma now the pollen tube will grow i need let me separate this the pollen tube is going to grow downward this way don't forget the pollen tube is formed by the intine 
it will grow downward into the style. The pollen tube is actually going into the ovary, but it will go through the style. Don't forget in your pistil, you have ovary, you have style, and we have stigma. So stigma is the first point of contact. As soon as the absorption, the swelling takes place, pollen tube will grow downward through the style. This is the style, and it's coming to the ovary. It is in the ovary that the actual fertilization will take place. Now, as soon as, it's, as, soon as it gets to the ovary, don't forget the two nuclei we have there. We have tube nucleus, we have generative nucleus. The generative nucleus, okay, let's put it this way. We have two nuclei in pollen grain. Tube and generative. Now, in the pollen tube now, you have the tube nuclei down and you have the generative nucleus up. Now, this tube nuclei is going to dissolve the end of this pollen tube and open this space. Why that is happening, the generative nucleus, which some people call vegetative nucleus, is going to divide. I hope you remember your, the process of mitosis and meiosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So this generative nucleus is going to divide into two. It will divide into two. As soon as it divides into two, now we have two nuclei from the generative nucleus. Now take note of this. This pollen tube then moves into the ovary. In the ovary, you have egg. And we have two bipolar nuclei. Two bipolar nuclei. Now, the two nuclei that we have here, in some textbook, you see it as sperm cells. They are now referred to as sperm cells. These are the real gametes that we fertilize the egg. Now, these two nuclei, we move into the ovary. One of them, we fertilize the egg. And you know when the male and the female gametes, when they meet, it forms zygote. So one of the sperm cells, we fertilize the egg to form a zygote. Why the other one? Don't forget, generative nucleus has been divided into two. The other male uh, gametes, which is the sperm cell, we fertilize, we fuse with the bipolar nuclei in the oval to form embryo. Endosperm, pardon me, endosperm, endosperm. Now, take note of this concept, very important, very important. This aspect is key because this is the term we refer to as double fertilization. When you're asked to explain the process of double fertilization, what the question is asking you is, the generative nucleus that we divide into two, explain what will happen to the two sperm cells. I take that again quickly. One of the sperm cells we unite with the egg to form zygotes, while the other one we unite with the bipolar nuclei to form endosperm. When you are explaining your double fertilization, these two concepts are important. As soon as fertilization has taken place, then we move to the last stage, which is development of embryo. Embryo now, which is this zygote, is the organism that is growing. It will grow out, you know, in a seed. When you plant a seed, something will grow out. So that thing that is growing now to form a new seed, the zygote, is what we now refer to as embryo. So this embryo that is growing up in a seed, when the seed is still young, there is need for food. And that food will be supplied by endosperm. When you see a young seedling growing up that cannot photosynthesize, but they are growing, something is making it to grow. And that is because of the food that has been stored 
in form of endosperm because of the double fertilization. We have come to the end of the process of reproduction. I hope you understand this. Thank you for attending today's session. For further reading and reference, please select genetics lesson contents that is available on learnathome.ng. Do join us next week, same time, for another exciting session. Thank you.